Welcome to the Writing Western Podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Rensink. Today we talk with Professor Miroslava Chavez Garcia about her book, Migrant Longing Letter Writing Across the U.S. Mexico Borderlands. Let me take a quick moment to explain a bit about the podcast and who produces it. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. For better or worse, it's a one-man operation with me, Brennan Rensink, playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, and everything else. I'm associate director of the Red Center and an associate professor of history at BYU, neither of which roles trained me for the current task. But I do have a lot of fun doing this because I'm passionate about better understanding the North American West, the region I have called home for most of my life. In each Writing Westward episode, I have a conversation with writers of the region, academics, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, anyone authoring anything about the West. My goal is that these conversations will spark listeners' curiosity to dig in a bit more themselves and think differently about the peoples, histories, environments, ideas, and identities that make up the North American West, or that we ascribe to the region. Please leave reviews or comments on whatever platform you are listening and let me know if we're succeeding. For updates or communication, please follow Writing Westward on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West. You can find all episodes on our website, writingwestward.org, or listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or most all major podcast distribution platforms, apps, and services. To learn more about the BYU Red Center, Stay tuned, and at the end of the episode, I'll offer some additional information about our projects, programming, live-streamed lectures, funding opportunities for research, and events. Find the center at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D Center. For more regular updates, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at BYU Red Center. Now, let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. Miroslava Chavez Garcia is a professor of history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with affiliations also in the departments of Chicana, Chicano Studies, and Feminist Studies. She's an award winning author, widely praised for her intersecting the study of gender, race, immigration, incarceration, borderlands, and family. Today we're talking about her book, Migrant Longing Letter Writing Across the U.S. Mexico Borderlands, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2018. In Migrant Longing, Chavez Garcia uses hundreds of her own family's letters, written across the U.S.-Mexico border in the 1960s and 1970s, to explore how Mexican immigrants to the western United States and those who remained in Mexico negotiated distance, separation, and belonging, how they forged new identities and preserved old ones, how they maintained relationships, and how they created intimate transnational networks and communities. By providing ample historical context and background, her family's intimate letters reveal the diversity of migrant dreams and desires, also their strategies for coping with the migrant experience and their transnational lives. Her work should cause us to pause, to reconsider the migrant lives still being forged in the American West. Perhaps we can learn sensitivity to the deeply personal challenges that many immigrants in our communities are still wrestling with today. More broadly, Migrant longing left me wondering about my own family relationships and correspondence, especially in the current time of COVID-19, social distancing, and isolation. It's a good moment for us to pause and to think about the communication we send to one another. I hope you enjoy our conversation and pick up a copy of her book. Professor Miroslava Chavez-Garcia, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to do these. I wanted to explain a little bit of background about um, why I wanted to have you on to talk about this book. And then with that background, I kind of want to ask you one potentially off-topic question to start things out. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, so I added Migrant Longing to this list of books after seeing it at the book exhibits, I think at the Western History Association. Mm. And I've been trying to pick writers who bring a diversity, not only of topics, but of methodologies and approach. And First of all, I haven't done a proper Borderlands book, which as a Borderlands historian really makes me feel guilty. But I was also intrigued that this was a book about letters and letter writing. Most historians use letters as primary sources, but very few of us use letters as the primary, primary source, an entire book built mostly off of letters. So I thought that was really exciting. So 
that's a little bit of background, and here's my potentially odd question. As I've read and gone through this book over the last couple of weeks, I realized that I was reading it in a much different context than I had anticipated. We're living in this really bizarre world now of quarantines and social distancing, a world in which we're having to kind of reassess how we communicate with one another, how we maintain relationships with friends, family, coworkers, as we can no longer just sit down and, and talk with them. And as I was then reading about some of your family members communicating and trying to maintain relationships as they were separated by distance in an international border and sometimes living in isolation, and then also this central theme of longing, I found myself realizing that I was reading this in a different way than I thought because of where we are right now. You know, mm -hmm. um, last night I had a book club with some neighbors and normally we would just go to each other's houses and have our book club, but mm. we did it all on Zoom. So the odd question I have is in this present context, or even more broadly, as you've spent years now thinking about letter writing and personal correspondence, I'm curious yeah. um, how your relationship with communication and connection has changed as you immersed yourself in in letters and other people's distant communications over the while, while doing this project. Yeah, um, in thinking about the letters and handling the letters and you know being with the letters, reading the letters, and so forth, it became a little bit of putting myself in their shoes in terms of understanding the meaning and the value of a letter. I think it now we're perhaps in a closer context in which these people were writing in the 1960s in the sense that we have that real sense of isolation, as you're saying, um, of people being far away, not being able to reach out as easily. You know, it's really hard for us to sort of imagine that world where the phone um, – no, the phone, we just take it for granted today, but, you know, even for them, the phone was um, a difficult commodity to sort of access or it wasn't seem, even though it was around a lot, it was my question. I thought, why don't they just pick up the phone? Why wait for the letter? And, but yet the letter is something that's so precious. I think that in looking at the physicality of it, you know, and touching the letter. And for me, that became initially felt like, wow, this is a letter that my parents handled. This is a letter that my grandmother or my grandfather, you know, sat at his, desk, you know, as I say, pounding out literally on this, um, on this, uh, typewriter, right? Mm -hmm. And so that I think in thinking about, and not only that, yeah, the physicality, I'll go back to that point and how that was, again, it embodied the other, right? Embodied the, the receiver. And I think this whole idea of constituting, right? That these letters constituted the relationship is, you know, it just, and, and I mean that in a very literal sense that, you know, without this object, without this letter, of um, handwritten, beautiful script or whatever, however it looked, there wouldn't be a relationship. So that was the vehicle through which it made it real. Hmm. And I think that that's really hard for us today to kind of understand. But I think for me, as I went through, you know, several hundreds of letters, I could see that and the, the kind of faith that people put into the letters. And it was the soul that went through these letters uh, for some of the writers, not all of them. I think some of them taught, you know, treated them more as, again, just vehicles for information, but others definitely was putting themselves out there. I think we have lost that. Mm -hmm. We shoot emails off so quickly, uh, or we're texting each other and these more really informal versions of communication of, or what dominate kind of our personal relationships. Yeah, I think that sometimes we have this nostalgia or this sense of like, oh, you know, the good old days when we would write and think about, it's not as simple as that. It's, um, I don't know if we've lost that, oh, that, you know, taking that moment to really think about what we want to say and how we say it. Because even then, you know, the, the, the paper is not cheap for them, you know, to go get it physically, to have it and to be able to, and carve out the time to do it, um, whether that's, you know, hiding from family members who don't want you to write to so-and-so, whatever, it becomes a valuable commodity in some ways, you know, the time and, and effort. But, yeah, we need to be careful. I always tell my children, uh, be careful what you say because you can't take it back, right, even when you write it. Yeah. So sometimes I have to, like, remember those words myself and go, ouch, when I say things. And um, I tend to be a very literal and blunt person who know me. Um, I do have a filter, but uh, I just think that, you know, sometimes honesty is sort of the best policy. But again, we need to be careful on who are, we need to be conscious of who is receiving our words because everybody's different. A little, everybody receives things a little bit differently. So that takes real skill to do that. 
So I hope hope I answered a little bit of um. Yeah, I just I'm, I was just kind of curious about your headspace about how you think about you know communication after having spent so much time with with all these letters. I had a a job once uh, doing translating work, and one time mm-hmm. I was translating f- phone call transcripts between an inmate and his family, um, okay. translating them out of Romanian and into English. Oh wow! And it was really interesting, you know, going through just these phone calls. And I'm curious, you know, if you could go back and have, say, let's say they did have phone calls and there were transcripts of them uh, between your two parents, don't you think they would read so differently than, oh, yeah. than how the letter was? Well, as you're saying, like, to write a letter, it's there's a lot of intentionality in it. You sit down, you think carefully, okay, what words am I going to carefully choose to put down on paper, on this paper that's going to cost me money and the post is going to cost me money. Right. I think even though there's a kind of an honesty there, like an intentionality, but the intentionality can also be um, creative, right? This sort of, and one of the things I talk about a lot in the book and how they, they use the letters to create a particular kind of identity and a persona to craft this image of, you know, whoever they wanted to be to this other person in this letter. And so definitely I think they took time to think about, well, what do I, how do I want to convey myself? What do I want to picture myself and that became very um you know obvious in the letters and so then sometimes you think you know, how honest are these are these just really a caricature <laughs> that they're trying to uh portray and definitely that is also a front it's also a cover and and that happened especially when I looked at the letters that my father wrote to my mother where he's telling her um you know they're writing back and forth he's very fluid with his prose and you know he's saying all these beautiful things to her and then when he goes to visit her, he doesn't have a word to say to her. You know, they just they talk. And and in the letters when I'm reading, I'm thinking, oh, he proposed or and every time it's a, he visits her, which is only about three times in the series of these, you know, a three year courtship. I keep thinking, oh, he's going to propose. So he actually never proposes or she never says yes. Right. Or I do. I will marry you. It just kind of unfolded the snowball sort of just ran away from her. And so he could never really communicate in person. I mean, he just said, he says in the letters, even though we didn't say anything, the words, to, you know, for, for we didn't exchange these words. I know that you feel this way. I, I, I waited to come back to be able to write to you and to be able to say those words. And I thought, that's crazy. Like huh. they, they had the chance and yet he didn't take it. He actually said he felt safer. You know, the, the distance in the letter became a very safe uh, but and I guess he, one thing he worried about, and he said a lot, he would say in his uh, letters, is rejection. He didn't want to have that rejection, that face-to-face rejection, which we know, you know, still is something that um, uh, that you know, men, not always just men, but you know, that, that's one thing that they face that becomes challenging. But so it was interesting how these letters can become also uh, craft working, you know, crafting mm-hmm. this image of these uh, whoever they want to be for that particular person. So they're not necessarily their most authentic selves because they may be, yeah, creating a persona. But your father also was, even if he was not always being authentic necessarily in those letters, it is where he was more able to express his most intimate feelings. Yeah. Because of the distance. Right. Yeah. Tell us about how you came across these letters and this family archive. Uh, you, you explain it in the book, but give us that, that little narrative of how you kind of built up this collection. Sure. Um, that's one thing. That I've been thinking about, I think can can say it a little more concisely now. <laughs> um, so essentially, we have what it is. It consists of what I see as two parts of correspondence. The first set of correspondence was between my parents. It's about eighty-five letters, and we had those in our basement um, when I was living at my aunt and my uncle's home. As I say in the book, my parents died in a car accident with, along with my grandmother. Uh, we were in a car accident in 1981. Um, I was 12 years old. My brother was 13. He and I were the only siblings, and both he and I survived. So when my parents died, we moved in with my aunt and uncle who raised us. And so then all of our things, you know, the few things we kept, we kept put in the basement. And I would go down to the basement off and on when I was at my aunt and uncle's house just to, you know, get things and if I was moving or whatever. And I remember seeing those. They were in a pack in a sort of a Ziploc bag of, of some kind. And so I would look at them. When I was an undergrad, I found them and I started reading them. I couldn't make sense of them. They were handwritten in Spanish. And I just was like, I'm too busy with my life. And so I left them there. And then years later, when I went to go look for them, I couldn't find them. And so I thought, oh, I just thought, well, maybe I took them as an undergrad and I just lost them. And then in 2012, when I had recently moved to Santa Barbara, so I had been at Davis for many years, uh, my uncle 
found them. What had happened was my aunt uh, who raised me, his wife died of cancer. And so, which was horrible. Um, she kind of had raised me as a daughter and never called her mother, but you know, it was a very close relationship. And so my uncle was cleaning the basement. He said he blamed her for being the pet rack. I'm not sure if that's so true. But um, so then he came to visit me and he brought the letters and he's like, here, I think you might need these or want these. And I thought like, oh, where did you find those? And I had just moved here and I had just was looking around for another project. I had finished my second book and I was looking for another project and it was perfect timing. And then I started looking at them and, you know, figured out what was going on with them, did all this, spent probably a good six months to eight months working on them and writing an article and so forth. And then he said to me, oh, oh, I think I have letters, too. And I thought, well, OK, let's, where are they? So then we go down to the basement again. Right? That's treasure trove. Go down to the basement and he goes down there. He's tooling around. He comes back up with his trunk. He comes back up. He pulls it out and then he opens it. And then we're like, oh, goes, oh no, they're not in here. So he closes the trunk, so he takes it back downstairs and he pulls up another one and opens it. And there are the letters. So these bundles of letters um it with, uh, I think there was rubber bands around, so several bundles of letters. So I started going through them and I'm realizing it's the same time period, right? The same similar hand period, 1960s, letters from my grandfather to my uncle, letters from my father to my uncle, like again, same time period, uh, all kinds of letters, more than 200 letters. And in those letters, I also found letters between my uncle and my mother's older sister, who he did, who had dated. And I knew that, but I never knew quite the story behind that. So, but they, did, they didn't get married. That's not your right. aunt. Yeah, yeah, right. They didn't marry. And that aunt just died recently and kind of interesting telling her about the letters because she didn't know about them. Anyway, so I had all these letters and I thought like, this is perfect. This is like puts all of these relationships together. And then I was able to then bring the letters between my parents and my uncle and they all kind of came together. Um, there's even some letters where my dad is writing to my uncle and my mother is writing in there, right? So she sort of piggybacks on that letter telling him um, about his relationship with her sister, right? So it's all these like back and forth. Um, and so all these relationships sort of get played out. And then I got a small set of other letters, about five other letters that my um, father's youngest sister, that she had written between her boyfriend. It also worked in to the letters because there's references to my, to my uncle's letters, to my aunt's letters. Anyways, there's all these connections there. And so... It just kind of came together beautifully. So it's over 300 letters, same time period, same people, you know, and it helped make sense. With my uncle's letters, it really brought a lot of more um, context and just richness to all of these letters. So, um, yeah, I was like, wow. And also, I think the fact that this was my third book that I was working on, that I thought like, eh, I could do whatever I want. You know, mm-hmm. no one to care. So that really, I do have to tell people that for me, that was um freeing in the sense that it allowed me to write this book that I would don't think I would have written as a first book. People have asked me that too. Would this would have been your first book? So I don't know. I I'm I don't think so. I think that it just happened to work. And also I worked really hard at my writing over the years. You can see the evolution from my first, you know, dissertation to the second book. I mean to the first book, then the second book. And so I write in a different kind of way. And I never wanted to do family histories. I remember when my first book, I would be at the Mormons, you know, the Mormon History the, Association. Yeah. Yeah. At the libraries. At the oh, the library. In yeah. L.A. and Santa Monica and in the, in the West L.A. It's a huge place. There's all these people doing genealogy. And I was there looking at mission records from the 19th century. I never wanted to do family history. But, you know, it's always a time and a place. It's things happen at the right time. And this family history just sort of a family history came at the right time for me. So how so. do you approach it as a historian? There's no such thing as a truly, fully objective historian. We all bring something to the subject. We all become emotionally invested in our subjects. But writing a family history about your own parents, grandparents, uncle, that's very different. How did you approach kind of bringing your professional expertise to such an intimate topic and intimate sources? Right, right. I think... When I first started, I was talking to some editors about this project and I really was like, I don't know what this is going to look like. It was that it was like, I don't know where to put this. Is this a history? What kind of a history is this? And so and I did sort of talk to people about this project and I did get some pushback. And I was surprised um, from the people who it came from, because these are people who I thought were very, you know, feminist scholars and so forth were saying like, oh, that's problematic. You know, how are you going to be using those sources? And I thought, oh, so that really pushed me to sort of read and dig and learn more about, you know, this idea of not just objectivity and subjectivity, but thinking about letters as a source and other kinds of sources, 
like what might be the problems with the other sources that these sources might not. So I, I learned and I read a lot to think about how I could use these letters that would be effective. And luckily for me, I also know this history pretty well in immigration across the U.S.-Mexico border Been teaching a class for like 20 years. So these things, as I read the letters, I thought, oh, my God, they're talking about what is exactly happening. You knew exactly where they fit, the right. context. They just right. fell in it place. Just, Right. So my uncle in 1962 is writing about the Chicanos and I'm thinking like, they're using the term Chicano and why would an immigrant recently arrived even know that term? You know, that mm. seems so, you know, so all these things that they were mentioning, you know, my, um, learning about, I knew that my, um, father, father's, um, youngest, he had two or three siblings who died in infancy, right? And so that was related to the lack of medical care and the, the disease that wrecked Mexico in that time period. So a lot of the things just, sort of fell into place again. And so I thought, like, I can tell this really great story. It's not about my family's history because no one's really going to be interested. And that was my fear. Like, oh, I don't want this to be anecdotal. Like, oh, nice, nice. It's on the shelf. And that's just one of these boring books that nobody reads, right? Even family members don't read. And then I didn't want that. I wanted to make sure that this was a way to a vehicle to tell this broader story of things that were happening. And how wonderful that I can tell um, about the personal and the emotional impact that immigrants and migrants face because there's so many books I and mean, there's tons of books right now that we have which are wonderful you know borderlands but immigrant you know immigration migration about the sort of economic pull and you know push and pull factors that i talk about in my class um but i also talk about the fact the personal i say there's a lot of personal things that we don't know why people made decisions right whether it was you know escaping an abusive relationship whether it was you know uh, trying to find a somebody who had left and you were trying to find them, you know, who had left decades ago, a, a family member. So these letters were that opportunity that I had. I thought no one's really written about the personal and the emotional. There's very little. So there've been some good books that have used uh, oral histories to tell that history, but that's a little bit different. It it's has different, it's like anything. Yeah. It, and it's like, you know, any source, it has its challenges and so do letters. But what was really fun with the letters, you know, when I would talk to people who had been to letter writers, I'd ask them, you know, a question about what had happened. And they said, well, I don't remember. And I said, well, in the letter you said this. Oh, I did? Like, they couldn't remember. But um, it wasn't like I was testing them, like, is the letter right or are you right? But still, it was fun to say, like, oh, it's in here in the letter, you know, um, as it was being lived. In me so the immediacy of that letter is just awesome. It's just really great to see all these small details. Yeah, I think the personality that comes out in these kinds of sources is what's so often missing from, mm. you know, big macro level histories, especially when we start doing transnational and borderlands history and often the geography starts to really zoom out and we lose the intimate personal stories right. sometimes. Yeah. A question that has come up repeatedly when I've been giving book talks on my book is people questioning, saying, well, what about these oral histories you used? And, you know, how do you trust them as sources or are they historically reliable? And sometimes similarly, you know, about newspaper articles that are clearly very biased or, or a letter, which clearly is giving a very particular point of view. And I say, well, you can corroborate things. There's ways to test and weigh the history and the sources. But uh, more than that, you can use it to insert into your narrative what people were feeling and thinking and mm -hmm. interrogate that. And those are the histories that always grab me the most, the ones that have a good amount of that really rich, uh, intimate primary source material, however problematic it may be. Right, it, right. It's what makes the history really feel real. Yeah, yeah. With all the complexities and the, and the, um, especially as I saw with my parents, the, I won't call them contradictions, but the kinds of things that I, that I didn't really want to see, right? That were not so nice about them. But then I realized these are people that I didn't really know, and I thought, and as I say in the introduction, I talk about this idea that the letters would be a way to connect with them, to get to know them. And yes, I did get to know them, but they were not the same people, right? So these were different people and i realized so i try i try to treat them in that way i think also in my situation because my parents have been gone for such a long time it was a little bit i don't want to say easier but maybe somebody whose parents recently died it might be more in terms of the legacy and the, you know the memory or still living oh, right <laughs> right uh and so with them i was a little bit i tried to i saw some things in my mother's you know i thought oh that's not very cool but you know well that's what was going on so let me write about that yeah. And so those are complex. I mean, I always say they did the best that they could with what they had at that time, you know. 
And so I'm not going to go beyond that. We can't expect things. You know? um, so, so yeah, it just, it, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Do you have any advice for other people that are considering, you know, wading into the world of their own family history and trying to piece things together or write a narrative? For sure. They have letters. I mean, I've had people tell me, I had this one person at the California State Archives. I was doing some research there and she was working, at, she's a staff person. She said, oh, my father, I just found my father's letters um, that he wrote to my mother when he was in the Vietnam War. He's like, I didn't know him before the war. I knew him afterwards. And here's a series of letters. I thought like, oh my God, that is like golden. You know, what was he like before that? And to go through that those letters. And so she had them. I'm not sure. I told her like, you know, contact me. Anytime I hear people who have letters, I tell them like, you know, these are like, would be beautiful to work with. I've also tried to find more letters. I went to my parents' hometown. I asked around and one person's like, Oh, I have a letters. And then I was like, Oh, I couldn't find them. I don't know where they are. So it's really hard. To, I sort of gave up on that. I thought I'm going to, you know, apply for an NEH grant. I'm mm-hmm. going to go out and get these and digitize. Didn't happen. People, you know, again, a lot of times they're just simply gone. Yeah. Or sometimes they just, they don't want, they find them very personal. I mean, for every trunk of letters that an uncle does find right. in the basement, there's trunks that have gone missing. Yeah. 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 And I, my grandfather, who appears in the book, he had a trunk with stuff, but apparently this great flood, you know, they told me about the great flood. Like, I just imagine this trunk just like floating, floating down off. the street. <laughs> and then everything got full of mud. And I, and I hear that story like th- three times I already heard it. I thought, okay. If it exists, it's not, they're not giving it up, but I, I'm pretty certain that it, all his stuff is gone. So then my f- grandfather was also pretty good at keeping records, but I would try to encourage people to do, yeah, if they have the letters, by all means, contact me. So if you're listening to this, mm-hmm. I am available for any kind of consultation. You have lots of advice. Good. I gave a family history presentation to some people in my neighborhood recently, and I said, these could be really big and daunting scary projects but start somewhere you know if you have some documents transcribe them and just start with that or get a file folder and try to organize them yeah um, yeah one other thing that i couldn't find um that was would have been really cool to add to this is so i write about in the book about so the letters become a really important communication and the phone as well so in my grandfather my parents excuse me let me back up in my dad's house, right, where he grew up with my uncle and my dad and my uncle, there was uh, five of them, four boys and one female, a big age range. So some of them had left, you know, the older two, two older ones had left before my father left the house to the, to the, um, the U.S. North. And then so who stayed behind were my uncle and his younger sister. So they were the youngest ones. Nevertheless, so years afterwards, my uh, the phone finally came to the small town. So they were from this small town as I write about in the book, and the phones came, but only to a few people in town, right, the bureaucrats, and then a few of the people were able to get them. And so my uh, my um, my aunt, my uncle's, my dad's youngest sister, she got into the phone business of letting people come to the house and use the phone for a fee. And so she was smart in doing that to be able to make money. And I'm thinking, I'm not quite sure, I could still ask her, she's around, how she, they got the money to put the phone in. It's probably through the remittances that they were sending uh, and so she started charging um, people for using the phone and she would keep a log. So she had a log of everybody who would come with the name and where they were calling. I was like, oh, that would have been golden, you know, like, you know, North Carolina. This is like, you know, 1972 or wherever they were calling that. You can itself. map out the network. Yes. Where yes. people's relatives were by the phone calls. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, do you have those? And of course, she's like, no. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so all these things. But again, you need broader context, right, to be able to. Uh, and so any, yeah, you're right. I think it's smart to tell people, like, just start small. Uh, cause sometimes we don't even think like our scraps of paper or things that we threw in a shoebox are important. But, um, you know, material culture also is a way to do that. You might even look at people if they, if somebody's been sewing or knitting, I don't know, you get creative, um, in how you use source material. Yeah. Well, let's get into the book a little bit. Of the many themes you could have pulled out of these letters, you center these stories on this idea of longing. And you use that as a very flexible term, and you apply it in a lot of different ways. Can you walk us through some of the ways that you use this idea of longing and why you pulled that out of the letters? Sure. I think it's interesting that you ask because to me it seemed like a natural process because I'll say simple answer is my father used that word. He used that word um, 
and, and, and you're right, in different contexts or different ways. And, and the words in Spanish, um, that was a challenge in using, um, cause even when they talk about love, right? Like my mother will explain in her letters, well, it's a different kind of love. There's this kind of love. There's that love. And here's, so then even when I would look it up, you know, it's my Spanish dictionary was always open. And I, there's so many different ways to, to, to express that in Spanish, depending on how you use it in the context. So one of the, the words that my father would use a lot is anelo, which is uh, it's spelled A-N-H-E-L-O. And at first I was like, how do you say that? Anelo, anelo. So um, he would say anelo, like I miss, I long for this and I long for that. So he would talk about the kinds of relationships that he longed for, the kind of a domestic space that he longed for what he looked for in a relationship to some extent he didn't spend he wasn't that deliberate but he would sort of talk around these these subjects and i knew that what he was saying that's what he was saying and so in thinking about the longing to me it just kind of jumped out at me because i had read about migrate migrants and this idea of longing and then another word is belonging like how do you attach and associate yourself right um there's a an article on uh, Nina, Sor- Nina Sorensen, who writes about uh, longing and belonging, uh, in, in sort of the, I think it was in the, in, um, the Dominican Republic in the context. I was looking at these studies at looking at migrant women workers who went to Spain, right? Uh, Latinas who are then contracted out to Spain and how they, that kind of experience, like the longing for home. And so that, and I've seen that my, my father thought this is a recurring theme, not just in, these letters, but, you know, for the migrant experience, the idea of longing. And so it became kind of very literal for me in looking at that. But then also I, I noticed that people would long for different things, right? So in the chapters, it's center, uh, centered around this idea where, for instance, my grandfather, he longs for his sons to pay attention to him, to obey him. But He wants to be that family patriarch, right? And he wants yeah, to hold yeah. on to that. He's not so much melancholic or nostalgic. He's just like demanding it, right? He demands their obey, you know, to, to obey and the patriarchal, for sure, the authority that he's, he feels is slipping through his fingers and literally it is, right? So, and also the sense of when my aunt, um, the girlfriend to my uncle, he, she's writing to him. I only had about 13, I think it was 13 letters, 14 letters. But where she's saying, where are you? Write to me. I miss you. You know, I'm never going to speak to you again. And then a letter <laughs> appears again, you know. Um, unfortunately, with my uncle's letters, most of them, I don't have the return letters, right? So I have letters they wrote to him, but he wrote, he sent them and he didn't get them back, of course. Yeah. But my mother's my father's letters, my mother would keep them and he kept his. And so then they became a set, which is yeah. quite unusual. That's what I understand. Yeah, it's not unless we have like official correspondence that you ever get like the onion skin copy of, you know, letters sent with personal letters. We don't really. Yeah, in the professional, uh, prof- more professional, um, people do that, you know, because they like to keep their own stuff. Um, nevertheless, with these other, uh, you know, so longing for sure. And all of these, they're, they're just, all, it just comes through. It's kind of, it's what they want. Again, it's attached to the emotional I guess, and so this idea of that, what they're looking for. And that's really beautiful because you could see the hopes and the dreams that we don't usually get a sense of that. What people love. Sometimes it's small things. Sometimes it's bigger dreams that they have. It seems like an emotion that really drives most of what humankind is doing, right? There's an absence, some hole that we're trying to fill in our lives, be it emotional or financial or whatever it is. There's always something we're striving for and longing to have. It's true. Um, it's kind of maybe one of the most basic you know, hu- human emotions. Yeah, and it's interesting because I've always thought of it as sort of within a capitalist framework, I guess, um, in my own personal experiences, um, like always pushing myself and driving myself hard. And I always thought, well, it's because of the, the capitalist culture that we live in to do more, to gain more, and that's what we want. But in talking to my uncle, when I actually did the oral interviews, I followed up with oral interviews, I told my uncle this, you know, the idea of coming north, the migration, what that was about. And a lot of us, it was, oh, it's to make it big. And then he's like, we didn't come here to, you know, the American dream. He's like, not for the American dream. And he goes like loud, you know, my uncle was like, and he kind of scoffed at that idea. He said, we came to eat, you know, to live. It's like beyond this idea of, you know, accumulate um, or, you know, the, the road is paved with gold, you know, that kind of idea. And I thought like, wow, okay. You know, there's, again, people come for different reasons, but that longing is, is in some ways for basics, you know. Why don't we talk about your parents? 
kind of the where and when of their circumstance of uh, your father being in the United States North and your mother uh, in Mexico and, and this courtship they hold. Sure. What's, what's the historical context there? And, and what, what do we see then in, in these letters? What's the kind of communication they're having? Right. So my father migrated to the North um, through the Bracero program in the 1950s. I found I actually still have his card, his matricula, as they call mm-hmm. it. And from 1954, when he came, and as I say in the book, his gra- his dad had come before, uncles, and his brothers were already here um, through that program. Some of them had left it. So he comes in the 50s, and he ends up in, in Pearl Valley, which is a primary destination. You know? Nobody wants to work in that hot, hot sun. And uh, so, um, so he ends up there in the fifties and he's there, you know, um, he's by the early 1960s, as I say in the book, he's, you know, hitting 30 and in Mexico, people tend to, to marry fairly young in that. And sort of the a period in which things are changing, certainly family formation in Mexico, uh, the families are getting smaller, but at the, still the expectancy was you to marry fairly young. And so he's in his thirties and he's trying to find a relationship that will sort of, you know, meet his needs in some ways. And so he's in Imperial Valley pretty much year round. Um, he would take a few, maybe a week or so during Christmas time or whenever things slow down to return to his hometown, which is in Aguascalientes. And he would go there and there was, apparently the story is that this had always been the rumor, right? That he had gone and he saw my mother, but he saw her from the back, right? She was a young woman. He's 30 and she's 17. And he thought that she was someone else, a cousin, it's true that a lot of the families we look alike. So mm-hmm. he, he approached her and then he realized, oh, it's not her, but it's somebody else. So then he started talking with her a little bit. And so the one he returned, uh, I guess when he was there, he had asked her, can I write to you? And she said, yes, that's fine. And so then he returns and starts writing to her, writing and writing. And she won't respond. And then he gets very upset. But nevertheless, I had always thought that story about him um, misidentifying her would have been a, a rumor. But it's in the letters, actually, where he says, I wasn't drunk. I, I knew, you know, I, I'm sorry that, you know, but I'm really happy that this happened. Um, and so he just says, you know, but I was worried that you wouldn't respond because I don't think of myself as a good looking man. You know, I think of myself as being ugly, fail. And so, um, and then it takes her a while to warm up to even to respond to him. Right. So, um, but she responds out of curiosity, at flattery at the attention. She's 17 going on 18, about to turn 18. You know, she's in secondary school, secundaria which she was the first uh, cohort of females to be in secondary school in that town. So her and her best friend, um, who's still around, um, she became my madrina later, my grandmother. And so she, the, them two were in the first primary, secondary class. There was about 15 of them, I think. So my mother and her friend, and then most of them, all of them were males. And so she had just grad, she just graduates. And they're having a relationship to the, to the letters. Well, not a relationship, but like a correspondence. And then he wants to be more serious, but she's like, you know, I'm busy and so she forth. She had other plans, right? She wasn't necessarily looking Certainly. just to immediately settle down. Not at all. Not at all. She she had ideas she wanted to. She asked him several times, what do you think? Should I go into nursing? Should I do this? Should I do that? And then she says, well, I don't really like blood, so maybe I won't do that. <laughs> and um, so she, you know, gets – and then as time goes on, so my curiosity was like, well, I know that they married, but how did that happen? Because she seems so reluctant. And, and so – at some point you see this sort of breaking down of her family circumstances where they had already been breaking down for a long time uh, under their, the rule of her stepfather. They had had some property, but over time they were losing it and losing it and moving around. And she, and even at one point she and her own second, the um, an, another sister, the, the one who ends up to be my uncle's girlfriend, they actually are sent from the home to do work as sales girls. Now that was, um, I was shocked to see that because that's, I thought like, oh my God, here are these, you know, this is the, what years are these? These are the 19, early 1960s. They're traveling a sales girl with a, another man and his wife selling beauty products door to door in these towns nearby. And I like, who does that? You know, especially there's, they come from a well to do family. They've lost a lot of economic means, but they're known to be this family who came from, you know, the, the, these ranchos, these big ranchos. And so I thought like, wow, that's gotta be, um, really degrading for them until she writes about some of the letters get lost, but and some of them are torn, but he manages to get some of these letters. Um, and you see what's happening there and doing that kind of thing. It's interesting. I saw that they kept that hush hush. And in one of the oral interviews I did with my aunt, with my mother's um, bro- a brother, 
he said, like, he said to me, turn, he was like, tell me the story. Then he says, well, turn off the recorder because I can't, I don't want people to know this, what had happened to them. It was in the letters and I thought, well, people know this. And, um, so we'll confirm that, that that had happened to them, that they were forced then to go do that. And so my mother realized that she needed to find a way to support the family and the way to do that, her big family, right? There's 14 of them, 14 children. Wow. The oldest one has already married and moved out. It's a way to get out of the house. She, my mother thought I need to marry and to help my family. So that's what she decided in the end to do. And, um, I don't think she married necessarily for love. And that's why I say she always sort of hesitated in saying, I do, and just kind of went through the motions. But, and I think most people will now will admit to that. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, she did grow to love him and it, it kind of comes through in the letters. So, and my father was just happy. You know, he was happy that she was going to join him and made it as possible as, as he could given the circumstances. Yeah. And it then allowed him to start building some semblance of, Kind of this life and family and a home that he that he wanted to have in the United yeah. States that he that he'd been kind of struggling to figure out like what his place in the world was there in the Imperial Valley, just yeah. a migrant laborer, but with kind of not really moored to anything. Do you think yeah. that these kind of very complicated ideas of what people were looking for in relationships? Do you think this is common amongst other migrant experiences? We have migrants from. Uh, Mexico and other places in Central and South America, all across the American West. And I mean, as you said, you know, if we had these phone logs, we could see this network of where mm -hmm. I mean, people weren't calling just to the Imperial Valley, right? So we have people all over the United States, but especially in the West and the Southwest, these kinds of relationships and people negotiating perhaps true romance, right? And they've fallen in love with someone who the border now separates. But other times there's other considerations. Uh, mm -hmm. Your mother's family situation, uh, how they're going to move forward economically in the future. Do you think this is a, a universal thing that's going on in migrant communities and migrant communication networks? Yeah, I think to some extent, what's interesting to see in, in I don't have a statistic, but you know, it's interesting to see how, how much effort people put into cultivating a relationship, relationships with people that they're familiar with in terms of culturally. So, so my question was like, well, why did he, not just him, a lot of people take so much time to cultivate relationships with people in their cultural context, right, in Mexico. Like, why didn't he just try to find somebody there in, in Pearl Valley? Well, there, it's, it's, but I said also, it's primarily male. I understand that. It's kind of a no brainer in that sense. But I knew he knew families there, that he was familiar with families, expatriates from his hometown who were living there. And, and there was also a family of like eight or nine women of that. And one of them, he, I'm not sure if he dated her, or if he was interested in her, or he had a friendship. Never went anywhere, but I just thought, why go through the effort, hmm. so much effort to write to somebody? And even today you see that where, where immigrants will go to places that they know there are people from their hometowns, right? Or that they will know they don't, why not take a risk or go out? I'm not even sure it's a risk, but I think that something about having the familiar is important to them. Um, not to say that these relationships outside don't happen. And actually my father's oldest brother had, um, children two children with a um she was mexicana but she was like second or third generation so chicana that that was quite unusual you know um so then i think about what was it i think having the familiar and again this idea that that i borrowed from roger waldinger i can say his name right the political scientist at ucla this idea of wanting to bridge these two worlds right wanting to bring the here and the there and having them overlap like they want the best of both worlds but they want the best of what they had at home these relationships these ways to communicate and, and be who they are but to have it in the united states right so pulling that rug like somehow like bring the two together so we can have the best of both worlds in one place and i think that that's part of it but it's interesting that your father could have married a mexican-american woman maybe even one whose family was from his hometown and still held a lot of the cultural traditions that he grew up with. But he does gain something different from courting someone, f say, you know, fr from Mexico. Do you think there was a sense of wanting to keep a foot in b both worlds? Not that he wasn't interested in fully committing to the United States and living there for the rest of his life, because maybe he was, but, uh, but by marrying someone who had been raised in the United States, is he losing some inherent connection to where he was from, whereas marrying a girl uh, mm. who who was you know from Mexico helped him kind of yeah. 
Yeah. And it's not about authenticity, I don't think, but helps mm. him feel that he's still a part of that world that he had left. Yeah, I think that it's also safety. I think it's just feel safe, right? When you, um, you're with somebody who perhaps is raised in a different cultural context, you're, you're not sure what kinds of values. And, and so that's one thing I think even some social scientists will use, like, who do you marry, right? In terms of the nativity and how does that play into, um, cultural change? So I do think it's a safety and knowing the, the values, right? This idea of the values and the customs and how this person will respond. But there's also a sense of, I think that people then imagine, you know, more than perhaps maybe my father's ideas were not necessarily what was going on. You know, this, this idea like, Oh, I'm going to go get the perfect wife because they only reside over there and here they're all corrupt, right? Uh, because there is some, I do talk about that in the last chapter about yeah. the views of American women and even Chicanas, right? And even the, when my uncle, he's talking about the Chicano, he's like, oh, the Chicanos don't understand good music. You know, the good music is from traditional, this kind of music that I like from Mexico. And so I think that that's part of it, marrying somebody who's familiar because there's a, an edge of fear of the unknown, what happens, how much will my culture change? And, and you even, this is a, a constant theme. You see that as I use those letters, those, excuse me, they're interviews, right? Interviews that Manuel Gamio did in the early 1920s, where he interviews, um, quite several, uh, Mexican migrants living in Los Angeles. And the themes that they talk about are very similar to what is happening, you know, 50 years later, 40, 50 years later. So yeah, that's an interesting, like who you end up to be with and who you search for, right? Um, that still happens today through internet dating and, that huge world. Yeah. I want to touch on a, a few of the other uh, of your family members that you talk about. We, you already mentioned briefly your your grandfather and some of his communication with his sons and his desire to retain his place as the patriarch of the family. And he could feel as, you know, as they cross the border and move off of that family structure, slipping in his role in that slipping. Um, but the one that is maybe a little spicier and interesting is the story of uh, between your uncle Paco and then your one of your mother's sisters, who he does not end up marrying, and this relationship and long correspondence on and off relationship they have, and what I found the most surprising was these stories of uh, of surveillance almost, yeah, yeah. Um, which is interesting, you know, as the border separates and you can't have this daily contact. They then struggle with insecurity about, well, are they being faithful? Can you, can you tell us a few of these stories and how these come sure. out in the letters? Yeah, I was surprised too to see this. Like, I thought, man, these men are just as chismosos as the women, right? <laughs> we think of chisme as such a gendered concept, you know, this idea that chisme is what women exchange at the wash or Which wherever. Is gossip is the yeah, best gossip, trans- yeah, or, yeah. Or, or as uh, um, David Gerber says, social intelligence or social information. Um, but nevertheless, so, um, so it's, it's the irony. I mean, it, it kind of fits with the patterns of, you know, thinking about sexuality and how that's what works in this sort of patriarchal context. So my uncle's in the United States, right? He's traveled and he has left behind his girlfriend and he, they're, they're, they, they're trying to make it work. Well, she's really trying to make it work. I'm not quite sure what he's saying, partly because we don't have his letters, but he tries, I think he's trying to get her to come and she won't because she's waiting for him. Nevertheless, he's insecure about her and what's happening with her, even though he's saying he doesn't seem to be as interested. But he's having his friends, his male buddies that he's writing to, to keep tabs on her, right? I'm not sure if he's explicitly telling them all the time, but they love to share the gossip. <laughs> These small towns, that's, that's all that happens. You just talk about who's doing what. And so they're writing to him and telling him, you know, oh, I, you know, I saw her with the the guy with the hat, you know, which is kind of, it's hard to translate because in Spanish is el gorrudo, you know, the one with the big hat, the one, the guy, and they all, you know, sort of a way to pin somebody. And so that this guy comes in, you know, to her house. And, and so she admits later, he, she says, you know, this guy's been following me around. It's one of those brothers, the, the older brother tried to court my sister and they won't, he won't take no for an answer. I tell him, to go away and he won't, you know, uh, come, but I'm waiting for you, you know, you know, so she's, um, and, and so his friends, his male buddies are, are, will say like, Oh, I heard her exclaiming in the, you know, in, I saw her in the plaza with another guy. And he's, you know, so my, my aunt had a, you know, I didn't never knew this about her. She really had a lot of guys, a lot of suitors. And, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And I actually asked somebody and they're like, Oh yeah, she was a good looking woman, you know, and, um, my, and so, so she had, she was like beating him down with a stick. You know, that's what it seemed like because there was guys constantly trying to hit on her. And so she was, but waiting for my uncle trying to be. 
And yet these guys are communicating, you know, and they actually will say literally, here's the gossip of the day. You know, we'll tell him in the letter, los chismes del día. And so then they start telling him what's happening to her and so forth. And um, and so there's a sense of, you know, how the letter even became, these letters become even a sense of, you know, regulation of of, of um, controlling, you know, of how well people did. So the letters could be um, used, manipulated in that way. But she also used the letters. I mean, she would work with my, with my mother, right, using the letters to communicate with um, trying to figure out what's going on with Paco, right? So she it goes might, both ways, and, right? Yeah, it goes both ways. So she would... My mother was pretty good at trying to, you know, she would ask my dad simple questions to try to get information about her brother, about his brother. And um, he would answer my father like, no big deal. Like he was clueless, right? <laughs> what he, how he was being played in this relationship. Uh, but uh, so that happened that way, too. So these letters can be used um, quite literally as, a, you know, a weapon in sometimes. And again, the constituting the self, right? So my grandfather uses a letter to tell his, his uh, my uncle tells him, um, tells Paco, like, take this letter that I'm writing to you and show it to your brother, because that's him, that's the grandfather, right? Is re- is embodied in this letter. Show him the letter, telling him that I need money. You know, I need the house is crumbling, and quite literally, people have told me, yeah, the house is just you know in shambles. And, and show him the letter and tell him that I'm calling him to help for help. And so it's just it's fascinating to see how that I guess worked out. And I think I said one other thing. You know, in reading David Gerber's work, um, he has a book called Authors of Their Lives, and he does this, um, it's about British immigrants in the 19th century. And his book is amazing because, you know, most historians we think of, like we do empirical work, social history, but it's really a literary, half the book is literally a literary analysis of the letters and looking at um, the ways in which the letters function, looking at the tropes and the the uh, theories that we can use with the letters and the second half he uses examples to show us nevertheless the first half i mind that learning about these different techniques that write letter writers the universal techniques that letter writers use. so i was able to compare that and really help me understand oh that is not unusual or that is unusual so it gave me context for understanding the different devices that are used in letters so i would recommend people to look at that if they're going to gerber yeah david gerber so and he was really generous he read my article that the first article I wrote out of my book. Um, so he was wonderful. He just retired recently. What do these letters reveal to us about the landscape, you know, the racial, ethnic, economic, social, cultural landscape in the American West that these migrants were trying to adapt to and trying to make a home in, trying to belong in? Does the intimacy of these letters teach us something new about the Western worlds in which they were living? I think those, the broader, the context that I, that I argue about that I'm going to talk, you know, how I say like they're going to be, they teach us about all these things. You really kind of have to piece those together and really read between the lines to see those, those things, knowing some of the history. For instance, just my father's working conditions, right, in Pearl Valley. So generally we would think the history tells us, the history books say like they were exploited, they had these horrible relationships with their bosses and there's this, and certainly that happened. They had, you know, these, these working uh, conditions were quite difficult. But my father, he makes comments in there that I thought, like, oh, it's interesting. It's important not to sort of completely generalize, but to know that there were differences. So he would say, like, well, I, do, I drive the tractor now. I have more seniority. I have more privileges than other workers. He also says, I have a good relationship with my boss. You know, um, I consider him a friend. And later I actually talked to the boss's son who's still around and the, the wife is still around of his boss. Wow. And the son said to me, Oh yeah, I remember he used to come to the house. He would come over, he'd eat here. He, you know, they had this relationship, a friendly relationship. I'm not saying that it was his compadre or that they were hanging out, but nevertheless, it's not what you get in the history books. And you might actually read that as maybe this is just your dad trying to convince your mom that things are really great here. I'm chummy with my boss and maybe kind of trying to spin this story to make her feel comfortable about the idea of coming but you actually have corroboration then from from the family that he well, that, that there was something to it. Yeah, because he seemed pretty reluctant to even admit that he had some privilege, you know, um, because he. And I think that reluctance is probably because he saw how everybody else was, you know, living and, and being treated. He even the boss even let them use a home, you know, I mean a house, I'm saying a home. And of course, it doesn't mean like oh they give him a nice home. They're probably just saying yeah that way I have a captive labor force. However you want to interpret that. But so this context, the broader, um, you know, you got to like pay attention to the references of things that they're saying. Like my uncle was saying, 
you know, I have a new, I have a job at a car wash and I hope to make it. I want to study mechanics so I can maybe work there. So the aspirations, like why aren't they doing other things? You know, so limitations, you can see that. Um, yet you have to see the limitations, but also see the kinds of uh, opportunities that they have. So what are the opportunities and what are those constraints? And so I think the letters allow us to place that. But yeah, you need to be very deliberate in looking at that context and not just thinking, oh, everything was so wonderful, or they never talk about racism, so it didn't exist, you know, or sexism. So that becomes the challenge, just like in oral histories. Right? You're trying to get the person to say, yes, I was oppressed, or, right? or yes, these horrible things happened to me. Um, you kind of have to step in and sort of not take their words out of, not to manipulate the words, but I think to ground that in an understanding that makes sense. And then you also asked about how do they, the last part was like, how do they teach us something new about the borderlands? Yeah, but there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of different fields of study that this intersects with. There's some takeaway that other, you know, historians in the region of the West of borderlands, of labor history, uh, family, gender, sexuality, Mm -hmm. things that, that we should think differently. Right. I think about intimacy and how intimacy can mean many different things and how it gets played out. So the one of the, the, I don't know if it's a controversy or a sort of a, like, is there intimacy in, in these transnational relationships, right? Now we talk about transnational motherhood, transnational families, separation across borders. It's new terminology that we have for very old relationships, right? Because it wasn't, this isn't something new. And thinking about, are these relationships weaker, stronger, or the same? And, so there's an article that I read that was very useful to, to help me sort of thinking about this. It's called um, sending dollars uh, means love or something like that. Right. Or, uh, how about how sending money like represents love? Is that enough? What kinds of relationships are we, are we foregrounding? Or are we privileging? Right. Is it the people say, was well, it a Western concept of the family, the four, you know, people coming to being close, touching, saying, you know, speaking to, or are these relationships, equally viable across these, you know, large spaces across these, especially borders, international borders. And so maybe we need to think about how, what we consider to be, you know, um, intimate relationships. And part of it has to do with people looking at these transnational relationships being forged by capitalists, you know, capitalism and, and um, global economies and globalization and how we need to problematize globalization. But it's, then becomes the question, do we then say that globalization is tearing families apart? Are they, you know, are they diminishing families? Are we becoming less connected or the other way around? Are families becoming stronger across these lines? So I think that these letters really help us understand that for the Southwest, how people were able to maintain these relationships and make new ones, at least for the time being. They weren't perfect for sure. But neither are they, it's sort of like, be careful what you wish for, right? When the person's right there, you're like, oh, now I need to deal with you every day versus when I want to, you know, in yeah. mm-hmm. the letter writing. Um, so <laughs> so that's one thing I would say. Now that we can't uh, hang out with our loved ones and friends as much as we'd like to, maybe we'll, we'll all be thinking about this a little bit <laughs> differently uh, yeah. for the next couple of months. Um, can you give us a, a preview into what else you're working on or what might, what your next projects are? So I'm working on a project now that kind of revisits all these themes that I've done in the past. It's kind of nice, it kind of come together. So I'm looking at what I call, well, it's looking at the intersection of the environmental movement um, with population control and immigration restriction in the 1960s and 1970s and through about 2000. So um, I did find a set of collection of, of records here at uh, UCSB where I'm in Santa Barbara of a professor who uh Garrett Hardin who wrote about immigration restriction quite a bit and he has his letters that he sent out so he was meticulous so i have his letters that went out and so forth so i'm looking at how these how people who were advocates for the environment and population control in the 1960s then kind of morphed into immigration restriction and I, my sense is that they were headed there all along it wasn't like oh now i think they would say in the correspondence we can't talk about immigration restriction in the 1960s because people are not going to accept it. But once it becomes more in the late 70s, for sure by the 70s, mid to late 70s, then they pick up steam, right? And so this leads to the creation of um, organizations such as FAIR, the uh, Federation for Immigration Reform, and a slew of other organizations. Uh, and so these are people that were connected 
uh, with their interests on these, these themes, right? So it's all these people who had worked with eugenics, you know, the environment, scientists. Um, and so it involves people like I mentioned, Garrett Hardin, John Tanton's at the center. Um, there's other folks as well. And then they needed people to support them with lots of money. So we have uh, Cordelia May is one of their buddies. And so the correspondence, they're writing to each other and talking to each other very frankly about these themes. And so I'm looking at these relationships and these organizations. So right now I'm calling it, I'm borrowing a term from Betsy Hartman. She writes about the greening of hate, hmm. H-A-T-E. So it's about eco-environmentalism and eco-fascism, this, this, um, these kind of folks, and also the eugenics strain. So Harry Wire, who was part of the Pioneer Fund, he would also write to them, and he funded some of these people. The eugenics so, stuff seems to work its way oh, yeah. in all cuts. Co- Always, yeah. Even if it's and actually, uh, what's his name? Um, Garrett Hardin. Garrett Hardin would say he wrote in his letter, um, "The Nazis gave it a bad. Too bad the Nazis gave it a bad name." You know, it's like, oh my god. Oof. So this is a professor here from Santa Barbara. So yeah, so I'm working on that and Great. doing some research when I can. I have students helping me, and I just I'm trying to get some time off to work on it. I'm excited to write it. Well, that sounds really great. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be fun. Well, thanks for uh, spending a little time with us. Thanks for the book. I hope everyone goes out yeah. goes out and reads it. Me too. And thank you so much again for the opportunity. I love to talk uh, about my work, and you know, as we all do as academics, yeah. to talk about the work. So later, I'd like to hear more about your work. Maybe we'll, we'll we can meet up at a conference and chat. All right. Sounds great. All right. Thank you, Brendan. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave a review on whatever app or platform you're using, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll go ahead and put that link in the episode description if you didn't catch it. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and just about everything else. So you can direct any praise or critiques my way. I'm associate director of the Red Center and an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. You can find out more on my website, bwrensink, R-E-N-S-I-N-K dot org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. That's B-R-E-N-D-E-N-W-R-E-N-S-I-N-K. One last plug, if you live in the Intermountain West, check out the Red Center's digital public history project, Intermountain Histories, by visiting intermountainhistories.org, or by downloading the free mobile app by searching for Intermountain Histories on your Apple or Android devices. With this website and mobile app, you can read carefully curated about complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. Well, until next month, be well, be curious, be kind.